Hi everyone, this is Sarah Giles and I'm excited to share my research with you evaluating the downstream transitions in stratigraphic sequences within the Umbratna Syncline Wanaka Canyon. My research focuses on the Wanaka Canyons, which are these remarkable roughly one kilometer deep paleo canyons exposed in outcrop across the Flinders Ranges, and they're of interest because they're associated with the largest known negative carbon isotope anomaly in Earth history called the Sherm Excursion, and they're also broadly coincident with the emergence of the Ediacara fauna. So understanding the origin of the Wanaka Canyons could have implications for both of these. A deep water origin, as shown here in B, has been generally favored for their origin, but we hypothesize a subaerial origin, namely fluvial incision, for the source of the Wanaka Canyons. My research takes place in the Adelaide Fold Belt, which possesses a thick succession of near Proterozoic to Lower Cambrian strata deposited in a rift system that was later inverted during the Delamerian orogeny, which gives us the remarkable opportunity to look at oblique exposures of the Wanaka Canyons. My research takes a look at location number one here, the Umbratna Syncline Canyon, which is shown here on the right in a geologic map. The Umbratna syncline has four incision exposures, which have been interpreted as comprising one single sinuous canyon system based on the alternating paleocurrent directions shown in pink arrows here, um, flowing down to the basin in the north. Our research takes a look at the first three incisions and plans to eventually continue on to the fourth incision here. Here I showed the timing and stratigraphic context of the Wanaka Paleo Canyons, where in part A I showed the Ediacaran stratigraphy in the Flinders Ranges with our hypothesized location of the Gaskiers Glaciation at 580 MA. In part B, I show the Wanaka Formation subdivided into units, as by Haynes 1987. In part C, I show the carbon isotope values as measured by Husson 2014 for the Wanaka Formation. What we see here is that the nadir of the Shurim occurs in the lower Wanaka Formation and rises to positive towards the top, where this brackets rather than postates the Gaskiers glaciation. From this, we suggest that the Wanaka Canyons may be associated with a sea level drawdown um, potentially related to the Gaskiers glaciation. The origin of the Wanaka Canyons has been debated for quite some time, with the two leading hypotheses being deep water incision and fluvial incision. Deepwater incision is reasonable for the Ediacaran passive margin at this time, and the presence of sediment gravity flows and the lack of evidence for subaerial exposure in the canyon shoulders supports this hypothesis. This would suggest that the Sherm excursion could be primary in a global signature. The fluvial incision hypothesis is supported by the presence of upward finding sequences within the canyon fill at Umbratna Syncline, as well as the apparent downflow facies transition from channelized conglomerate to sand and silt on the meter scale, where for a submarine canyon, we'd expect these to be on the kilometer scale. The canyon fill also lacks classical turbidites, disk structures, and nested sandstone channels, which are incredibly common in other exposures of submarine canyons. For the Sherm excursion, this would suggest that the excursion is at least partially secondary as the basin would have been isolated for a period of time. To test our hypothesis, we first acquired drone imagery, which is shown here up top and compared to Google satellite imagery. We can see that the resolution has increased drastically and theoretically improved our ability to more accurately map surfaces. Mapping those surfaces, which is shown here on the map with blue, we use those to connect measured sections shown here in orange and evaluate the lateral and vertical transitions and place these observations within a physical sequence stratigraphic framework. From this work, we observe three dominant canyon fill facies, with facies A dominating the upper canyon fill and being composed of thinly bedded sandstone and siltstone with these tabular silty carbonate layers that were locally brecciated and deformed. Facies B and C dominated the basal canyon fill and were much coarser comparatively, with facies B being sandstone and siltstone event layers with flutes at the base, parallel lamination, and up into climbing ripples. Facies C occurred at very discrete levels within the basal canyon fill and was composed of stratified conglomerate, which we can see here some of those beautiful stratifications and even potentially some imbrication, and capping um, fine to very fine sandstones. At certain locations within the canyon fill, we're able to see downflow facies transitions on the meter scale. This is an example from the Mucca Baluna incision, where the blue and yellow arrows show you the general paleocurrent directions from corrected flute marks, which is to the right side of the screen for the paleo flow. 
if we look at section 28, we see a thin bed of pebble to cobble conglomerate that if we transition on the roughly 100 meter scale down flow to section 22, we see that that conglomerate transitions to these tabular beds of rippled sand and silt. We see this observation again in section six, where we see roughly two meters of pebble to cobble conglomerate that transitions on the roughly 100 meter scale down flow to section 23, which is a much thinner bed of pebble sandstone. Based on this, we suggest that this is more consistent with a fluvial um, canyon rather than submarine, as a submarine transition for facies would be expected to be on the roughly kilometer scale rather than meter scale. After aligning the measured sections using the map surfaces, we were able to observe up to nine sequences that were unconformity bounded and find upwards with a bed thickness decrease upwards within the three incisions. We established facies associations within each of the sequences, which allowed us to observe both the retrogradational and agradational stacking patterns that were dominant within the sequences. Our interpretation of the facies within each sequence of the basal Wanaka Canyon fill was that the basal conglomerate sands of the sequence were fluvial and transitioned into delta front and pro-delta sand and silt event layers, namely hyperpycnites. From this, we, we determined a transgression-dominated sequence model for the Wanaka Canyons, with the basal fill being composed of up to nine fluvial to deltaic sequences and later being transgressed by marine silt and sand in the upper Wanaka Canyons. We noticed a remarkable periodicity in the thicknesses of the sequences, which I show here the three incisions with the sequence numbers on the side with up to nine here. And on the x-axis, we see the thickness of these sequences. Here I show you Fortress Hill, which if we take a look at the geologic map up here on the right, we see that Fortress Hill starts off, it is this first incision and we go downstream to Muckabaluna. So what we see is that there's this roughly 30 meter thickness for the in, um, sequences here, and we see that at the level five to six, there's this double in the sequence thickness. However, as we go downstream to Makabaluna, we see that sequence thickness becomes much more sporadic, which we might expect for a fluvial system progressing downstream to the north. We were able to confirm sequence correlation between Fortress Hill and Mount Curtis, but we were not able to independently confirm cycle correlation with Makabaluna. In the interest of evaluating these sequence transitions downstream, we developed an argument on how these sequences might relate from Muckabaluna to the first two incisions from sequence thickness and sedimentology characteristics. At the sequence boundary six level in Fortress Hill, Mount Curtis, we see the sequence doubles in thickness, which if we look at Muckabaluna, we do not see the same um, doubling within the sequence thickness. Using this, we can argue that there may be a potentially cryptic sequence boundary within M uh, Mount Curtis and Fortress Hill that is displaying within Muckabaluna. However, at Muckabaluna, we see the distance between sequence boundary six and sequence boundary seven increases dramatically, which if you Divide this by 30 based on the standard roughly 30 meter periodicity observed in Fortress Hill and Mount Curtis, we see that there is the possibility that there are three cryptic sequence boundaries within this distance that have transitioned from the observable sequence boundaries in Mount Curtis and Fortress Hill. Using this argument, we are able to evaluate how the sequences may transition downstream from Fortress Hill to Muckabaluna. Aligning the sequences from Fortress Hill downstream to Makabaluna, we're able to observe how the facies transition within the sequences. At Fortress Hill, we can see that the yellow sand percentage decreases as you go up in the stratigraphy as the silt increases. If we look downstream to Makabaluna, we see that the conglomerate within the sequences transitions away while the sand and silt percentage generally increases. This would be our expectation for a fluvial system transitioning on a much shorter distance scale than we would expect for a submarine canyon. In conclusion, it is the combinations of features listed here and discussed that lead us to interpret the Wanaka canyons as severely incised. Within the canyon fill, we observed up to nine sequences displaying a roughly 30 meter periodicity. Using thickness and lithologic characteristics, we interpreted how the sequences may correlate from the Mount Curtis to Makabaluna incisions where independent correlation is not possible between sequences. We observed that the conglomerate decreases downstream in each sequence, while the sand and silt percentage increases, showing facies transitions at a scale more consistent with a fluvial system rather than a submarine. 
A severial origin for the Wanaka Canyons has implications for the origin of the Sherm anomaly and its timing relative to the Gaskiers glaciation. Thank you for listening and I welcome any questions from the audience.